Hello. In this video, I'm going to talk about teeth that are fractured and have pulp exposure, and what to do about them and why. We'll start with a review of the basic anatomy of a normal, healthy, intact tooth. Here's a diagram of the lower first molar of a dog, and in this we can see that the crown of the tooth is covered by a thin layer of enamel, <clears throat> the root is covered by a thin layer of another tissue called cementum, and then the hard tissue that makes up the bulk of the tooth is dentin. And then inside all of that is the hollow space that contains the blood vessels and nerves and other soft tissue, the dental pulp. And it lives within the root canal or the pulp chamber. So inside there is all the soft tissue. Now normally the only way in or out of the pulp tissue or the pulp chamber is through a collection of tiny little channels down at the tip of each root. The root tip is known as the apex, and because of the um, appearance of those little channels, uh, looking like how a, a river enters into a lake, that area is known as the apical delta. So that's the only place where the body communicates with the pulp chamber, um, and it's the only way into the pulp chamber in a normal, healthy, intact tooth. So the pulp is completely isolated from the outside world. It's only in communication with the body, through the tip of each root, when the tooth is normal, intact, and healthy. Here is a photomicrograph of a root tip after the tooth has been decalcified and the pulp chamber filled with India ink to highlight the multitude of tiny little channels that make up the apical delta. Here's another photomicrograph of a root tip showing the apical delta. Um, in this we can see the cementum um, covering the root and then the dentin inside and the pulp chamber there and the tiny little channels that make up the apical delta and in this particular instance there was inflammation around the root tip because of infection leaking out through the apical delta into the space between the root and the bone. The enamel that covers the crown of the tooth all forms before the tooth erupts. So when the tooth erupts it has all the enamel it will ever have. But underneath the enamel, it has just a very thin wall of dentin and a massive pulp chamber, and the tip of the root has yet to form. So in this series of three radiographs that were all taken of the same dog, but at different ages, on the left we see the radiograph when the dog was six months old. Massive pulp chamber, thin root wall, wide open apex. The radiograph in the center of this trio was taken when the dog was 14 months of age and we can see that the pulp has been busy producing dentin inside the tooth. So the wall of the tooth has grown much thicker, the pulp chamber is smaller, the root tip is formed, and we now have a closed apex with an apical delta. And in the image on the right, we see the dog at 32 months of age, and again the pulp chamber is much smaller and the wall of the tooth much thicker because the pulp has been busy producing dentin inside the tooth. Now that process of dentin production inside the tooth only happens as long as the pulp inside the tooth is alive. And the importance of this will be made clear later on. I should mention that the image in the center and to the right show evidence of restorations in the crowns of these teeth. And that's because this dog had a procedure known as crown reduction when it was six months old because of an orthodontic problem. So when you're seeing those white spots at the tips of the crowns of the teeth, those are restorations that were placed uh, when I saw the dog initially at six months of age. If a tooth suffers a fracture that exposes the pulp chamber to the outside world, what happens next is inevitable. You can count on it happening 100% of the time. The pulp is now exposed to the oral bacteria, and so the bacteria will contaminate the exposed pulp, and in time, set up an infection in the pulp, which will also result in inflammation which is painful for the patient. So now we have a pulpitis, a septic pulpitis. And in time, this is going to result in pulp necrosis, or death of the pulp tissue throughout the entire internal structure of the tooth. So even if the fracture is over the front root, it's going to end up causing pulp necrosis down the back root as well. So while this process is going on, while the bacteria are um, infecting the pulp tissue, and causing inflammation, that's painful for the patient. Once the pulp is dead, that sensation would go away because dead tissue sends no signals. 
But then what happens next is the bacteria will start to ooze out through the apical delta channels and set up infection and inflammation in the space between the root and the bone, the periodontal ligament space, and then into the bone itself. And at this point, we have what's referred to as apical periodontitis, or inflammation of the periodontal tissues around the root tip. And the body is completely powerless to stop this from happening. We have an open wound in the tooth, and there is no healing mechanism by which the body can close this opening. So the tooth can now be viewed like a hollow tube embedded in the jawbone that the animal is spitting into on a daily basis. Bacteria have unhindered access to this opening, and they will get in through the pulp chamber, out through the root tip, and cause apical periodontitis. And as I say, this is completely predictable. It's going to happen 100% of the time if a tooth suffers a, a crown fracture with pulp exposure, and if no treatment is undertaken to close this pathway or conduit for infection to get into the tooth. And here's a radiograph of a lower first molar in a dog that had suffered a crown fracture, developed septic pulp necrosis, and the apical periodontitis. So we can see a dark halo around the tip of the roots. This dark space here represents decreased bone density because of bone demineralization resulting from the chronic inflammation from the septic pulp necrosis and septic apical periodontitis. So bacteria have been coming down this pulp chamber out through the root tip, contaminating the bone tissue and causing demineralization um, due to the chronic infection and inflammation down there. So what's the point of all this? Why am I telling you this about fractured teeth? Well, because the message is that a tooth that has suffered a fracture and has pulp exposure absolutely requires either endodontic treatment or extraction. Those are the only two medically acceptable options that we can offer for a tooth that has a fracture and pulp exposure. We will sometimes hear from owners and or veterinarians that they might be taking a wait and see approach. Well, we'll keep an eye on it. We'll monitor it. Those are not acceptable options. All that is happening with these fractured teeth is happening inside the tooth and then outside the root tip, which is buried deep inside the jawbone. You can't keep an eye on that. You can't monitor it visually to see whether it's causing a problem or not. But from what I've just told you about the internal anatomy of the tooth and what happens when bacteria get inside the tooth and out through the root tip, you don't need to monitor to know what's going to happen. It will always end up resulting in septic pulp necrosis and apical periodontitis, whether you see signs of that externally or not, because those signs are buried, as I said, deep inside the jawbone out of view from the naked eye. So waiting, is, waiting and seeing, or taking a, a wait and see approach, all that does is it leaves the animal suffering in silence until the problem begin, becomes so dramatic that you can no longer ignore the issue. And by the time that has happened, the animal has suffered a long time and unnecessarily. So if you have a pet or if you have a patient that has a tooth that is fractured, and there is pulp exposure, that tooth requires endodontic treatment or extraction. No exceptions. And there is no other medically acceptable option that can be offered or endorsed. So as I've said, a tooth with a crown fracture and pulp exposure requires either extraction or endodontic therapy. Extraction is removal of the tooth. Endodontic therapy may take two different forms depending on the age of the animal and the age of the fracture. So think back to that series of three radiographs of the dog showing the size of the pulp chamber at six months, 14 months, and 32 months of age. If that dog had fractured its lower canine tooth at say eight months of age when the pulp chamber was still very large and the root tip wide open, that tooth would not have been a candidate for root canal treatment because root canal treatment involves removing all of the pulp inside the tooth and filling that hollow space with dental materials. And an immature tooth with an open apex and a thin root wall is simply not a candidate for root canal treatment. But if we have a fracture of an immature tooth and we were able to get to treat that tooth within 48 hours of the fracture, even up to 72 hours, then we can do a procedure known as vital pulp therapy.
And I have papers on my website that discuss both root canal treatment and vital pulp therapy. So I won't go into detail with that uh, or on that with this video. But this is why I have referred to those teeth as requiring endodontic treatment. If it's a young dog or a young cat with a recent fracture, that would be vital pulp therapy. If it's an older animal with a mature tooth, then it would be root canal treatment. So at the risk of being both repetitive and redundant, let me state again that when there is a fracture of the crown of a tooth and there is pulp exposure, that tooth absolutely requires either root canal treatment or extraction. Wait and see is not a valid medical option. Monitoring is not a valid medical op uh, option to consider. Putting the animal on antibiotics will do nothing of value and does nothing to affect the long-term outcome. The pulp will still die. The animal will still develop apical periodontitis. So when a tooth is fractured and the pulp is exposed, that animal requires treatment as soon as it can be possibly arranged. Whether the tooth gets extracted or has endodontic treatment depends on a whole other host of issues and factors, depending on which tooth it is, how badly it's damaged, how long the tooth has been broken, um, what the radiographs of the tooth look like, whether there is access to somebody who's able to perform endodontic therapy, and so forth. Um, but in no instance is it acceptable to monitor the situation or try and treat it medically or take a wait-and-see approach. All of those things will leave the animal suffering in silence.